Hello, friends and family of the world of paleoanthropology. Here we are on another episode of the Paleo Post podcast, your favorite and most informative podcast on everything paleo related. Here we are with George and myself, Seth Shoggy. We are going to be talking about some of the newest items in the world of paleo and archaeology, as well as just the goings on. And you are going to be so interested that you're going to be with the most interesting person at the dinner table, we used to say, because you will learn some amazing stories in this episode. So here we go. George, it's been a little bit. How are you doing? What's new with you? <laughs> you know, thanks, Seth. You are such a charming man. You really are. <laughs> uh, I, 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 would, I, would, I would have you at my dinner table any time, and I would introduce you to nice fish and chips, English fish and chips. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> uh, I, 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 first of all, I must apologise to you and the listeners, because I've been dodging um, over the last 10 days. I've had a very tight deadline for a, for a book that I've been finishing off. In fact, I delivered the, um, the manuscript, the plans, the maps, 150 images, it's a biggie, uh, to the publisher uh, about two days ago. So I'm wow. relieved in what... I'm relieved in one respect, but bereft in another. Yeah. The reason why I feel the reason why I feel bereft is I've got nothing else to do, nothing else to do. Well, I have what I need to do, in fact. So it's it's been really good, and the the book is um it's um it's an interesting book, in fact. It's probably something a little bit out of our our scope for this uh, uh, podcast, but nonetheless, I will I will promote it now. And it's a book called it's a book called The Architecture of Death. Uh, and the one thing I've always had an interest in. Uh, even before I started sort of delving into caves, was to look at the Neolithic. Now, the Neolithic in Europe is between, I say, 6,000 BC, if you're going really sort of in the middle of Europe, 9,000 BC if you're in Turkey, Syria, and in what we call the Fertile Crescent. And if you get to the UK, it's between 4,000 and 2,000 BC. So it's it's sort of sweeping westwards about a kilometre, about a, sorry, a, a kilometre a year. And by the time it gets to the, the British Isles, which are, at that point are the British Isles, so there is water between us and the continent, um, we start to take on some of the ideas of how we bury the dead. And what we're doing, we're constructing things like, wait for it, Stonehenge, which we all know about, Avebury, which we all know about, the big stone circle, and maybe a, you know, a good 2,000 um, Neolithic chamber tombs, ways of burying the dead, in what I would call artificial caves. So there's the connection. This idea of mm. in the Paleolithic, you're burying the dead in the, the deep recesses of the cave. In the Mesolithic, you're doing exactly the same. In the Neolithic, the early Neolithic, you're doing it. But at some point, at around about 3,500 BC in the British Isles, we started to construct artificial caves made of stone, earth, and turf. Mm. And so, and basically, we're doing exactly the same. We're going through the, the same processes, the mortuary processes of dealing with the dead, but we're putting him into artificial caves. So that's the connection. And uh, the book I've just delivered is uh, it's called The Architecture of Death. And it's looking at the Neolithic monuments of Wales, which is a small country, a very, very beautiful country where I come from. Uh, and uh, it's attached to England. For those of you who are around the world don't know what I'm talking about. And we have a population of around about 3 million people. So just gives you an idea how small we really are. And if you want to travel from one end of Wales to the other by car, it's about four to five hours because there's no straight roads whatsoever to get from north to south or south to north. And even going from east to west is difficult as well. Uh, but dispersed within those, uh, within the, uh, within, uh, within Wales, is around about nine core areas where you've got these uh, Neolithic chambered tombs being constructed. And what is quite interesting is I've deduced from the archaeological evidence, I've looked at the archaeological evidence of, of the evidence before the Neolithic, so looking at the Mesolithic and in some cases the Paleolithic, and surprise, surprise, there seems to be an overlay. So where you get Mesolithic activity, you get Neolithic activity. And sometimes you with the Mesolithic activity, you get Paleolithic activity. So within those sort of core areas of Wales and elsewhere within the British Isles, you're getting this um, this chronological sequence from the Paleolithic right through to the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, whereby the same areas, the same 
regions are being utilised for death, burial and ritual. So that's one interesting point. And then there is also within the, my research for this book, there are about four or five sites which are classified, I'll put it in inverted commas, classified as Neolithic chamber tombs. However, with good systematic excavation, it's been revealed that at least five sites around uh, around Wales have evidence of Upper Palaeolithic underneath them. So quite clearly, there's a stratigraphy of occupation in the Palaeolithic, for whatever reason, it's more than likely settlements, open air settlements. And then on top of that, you've got Mesolithic, and then on top of that, you've got the Neolithic. And then on top of that, you may have the Bronze Age. So a really interesting tight sequence of stratigraphy revealing maybe eight or 9,000 years worth of archaeology. So it's, you know, it is very, very exciting. And then there's one site which is really interesting where we've got the oldest musical instruments um, found in the British Isles. Now, it's nothing like what we see in Slovenia where you've got a Neanderthal flute. This is a Neolithic flute, which is around about three and a half thousand years or uh, three and a half, sorry again, three and a half thousand BC. So, but nonetheless, it's a musical instrument. It's a sheep's bone with 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 holes drilled into the the side of the sheep's uh, sheep's bone, and you can play a few notes on it. So, again, so so some interesting little quirky little stories, which I dare say I'll be dispersing in your way uh, over the next few podcasts. Um, the book will hopefully be out by, I think, uh, early summer this year. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot of a lot of imagery. Uh, the interesting thing about the book is that I did a similar book to it um, in 2006. However, the publisher, this just shows you how far behind I am in the modern world. Uh, the publisher didn't want slide or wet film negative photography. He wanted digital photography. So I was forced, luckily, to go around every site and re-photograph the, the sites. And that was good for me because it really did help me sort of think about um, or rethink my views on the sites I've been looking at. And so the whole, really, the whole book has been rewritten completely. Um, and I'm quite excited about seeing it uh, in, in print. So, uh, so when you can afford £25 or $30 or thereabouts, um, uh, it, it's it's, it's going to be a right riveting read, and I hope you'll really enjoy it. So that's what I've been doing over the last ten days. I've been panicking because there is was a very very tight deadline. I've got the book out, and I hope some of the things I've just been talking about uh, are of interest to our listeners. I'm sure they are, because uh, it's it's always good when you're when you are writing to get um, to get a um, to get a uh, uh, um, your your message across to people who may have a, you know, a slight interest in what I'm writing about. So, yeah, so that's one story. <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't know if you want to, I don't know if you want to fill in now and do something, Seth. So that's enough of me for the moment, Seth. What do you What do you got to say? You know that sounds absolutely amazing, and I just can't wait to read that book. You know, it sounds. I right now I'm actually reading um, "Buried" by Dr. Alice Roberts, and I'm loving it. And it sounds like it's in that vein of you know discovering you know specifically even you know UK Paleolithic, uh, Neolithic burials and everything. Um, so I am very excited to pick that up when it comes out for sure. And I hope our listeners are as well. And this isn't, you know, you guys, this isn't um, a big, huge promotion. Oh, go buy George's book or anything. We're seriously talking about it because it's <laughs> oh, yes, a it good is. piece of work. Well, I mean, we are, but it's a good piece of work. You know, we, we're not just sharing it because it's ours. We won't. It's not the purpose of this uh we're sharing it because we know you'll actually learn from it and you will enjoy it. <laughs> now, the next thing that I wanted us to talk about before we get to actually some paleo news or anything is on Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pacific time, the Leaky Foundation has invited me and has instructed me to invite everyone that I know 
to a virtual discussion group about the evolution of the human family. And as a soon-to-be father, this is something that interests me greatly. And I will be discussing uh, quite a bit on what I know about family evolution and what it means to become a father and questions and interesting things. And I'm going to be talking with other people. It's going to be a great event. You can find, I'll put the link in the description so you can RSVP. Everyone is welcome. And it's going to be a fun discussion. And again, that is Tuesday at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And it's it's free. It's completely free. Anyone can go. And it's virtual on Zoom, I believe. And all of that information will be given out once you RSVP and get your ticket. I guess. I uh, just wanted to throw that out there because that's coming up and that's going to be a lot of fun. And I will be there along with the Leaky Foundation. So it's going to be a pretty good event. So the story that I wanted to talk about is something that is pretty, in my mind, significant. So in Poland, there is this cave that is called the Paradise Cave. Yes, Ginya Raj, I think. Not, I don't know how to speak Polish, so we're going to just go with that. And it is a well-known cave system with spectacular rock formation. But little known to the many visitors who visit this cave system is that it is actually an archaeological site which research was started in the 1960s, but after huge quantities of animal bones and traces of Neanderthal visits to the cave were found, research kind of slowed down and stopped, as it often does in many locations, either funding or due to, you know, whatever reason. But um, research has recently continued at this location and we are finding items up to 41,000 years old that have been carbon dated pendants uh, that are 40,000 years old, along with other archaeological items and a lot of animal bones, including cave bears, cave lions, and mastodons. And one of the things that I think is most significant about this find is that the area, the pit that they have dug is extremely small. It's, um, I'm trying to find the exact size right here, but it's, it's very, it's a very small pit and it's not very deep. Um, and yet they're finding hundreds of animal bones. So this cave is very productive archaeologically. There's a lot going on. There is human, uh, modern human settlements and examples of people being there. There's Neanderthals being there. And we have all of these butchered and even non-butchered animal bones. So this was a cave that was been used for millennia. It was formed 360 million years ago out of limestone. And... Since 1972, has drawn thousands of tourists a year. Now, I'm sure that might change now that they know this is quite a archaeological site. Um, typically, we don't, you know, as archaeologists and anthropologists, we don't like these sites being uh, open to the public. So we'll see how long that continues. But have you heard of this site before? Because I had not even heard of it until uh, they reopened the research. I have heard about it, and what you've actually t touched on a really, very really interesting debate. I think we should have at one point is this mm -hmm. idea about the the access accessibility uh, to these sites by the public. Uh, we've got some very interesting sort of ideas going on in again in Wales again because that's where all the caves are, whereby mm -hmm. there, there's a, a reluctance to grill off or gate off the whole of the cave. Um, so that stops anybody getting in. Um, so, for example, uh, there's a cave site that I was involved in a few years ago called Catal Cave. And uh, it was seen to be the, the idea that we should 
grill off or gate off half the cave so that so anybody going in there wanted to experience what it was like living in a cave if you're a school child and you wanted to get that sort of that ambience then you could mm-hmm. get into that cave have a look around but you didn't you didn't make it do any damage to the cave beyond the grill where all the probably where the most sensitive archaeology and also the sense most sensitive ecology is as well because we've got obviously got bats there as well um so that seems to be a, a sort of an um an inherent path running through conservation of caves in this part of the world i don't know what it's like in the us um but i do know in spain for example where they completely gate off the whole of the cave or right. the whole of the rock shelter and there's no access in there at all unless you're a scientist or you've got particular permission to go in there and i can see the point i can see the point in one respect because believe it or not wait for it seth we do have stupid people within our society who oh, go yeah. in there with a go in there with a spray can or they'll go metal detecting or something and before you know it the cave is a mess now just to put that into con put that into context at cat hole before it was grilled off before it was gated um they had a film crew in there once and they wanted to reproduce uh, a famous cave oh, uh, yeah. near, nearby called the Red Lady of Pavlin. So guess what? They painted the walls red. <laughs> oh no! So, so luckily uh, they were reported, and they had to they had to uh, spend a lot of money paying a conservation team to take away all the red paint off the walls and oh. bring it back to its original state. But they actually made one hell of a mess. So I, I say it's not just yes. mindless vandalism. There's also stupidity as well. So that's an, an interesting debate we should have at maybe at some point in the, in, I, in the podcast. Absolutely, because and just briefly on how we can even go even deeper into that. So the research project that I'm working on, which is on the Kondawa World Heritage Site in Tanzania, which um, some researchers, including the Leakies, might think is some of the oldest rock art in the world dating up to and past 40,000 years ago what I'm working on like me specifically is working with my advisor and the locals on whether or not tourism is a good idea because one it can bring in a lot of money which can help with conservation it can help with protecting the site for their research but again you bring up what if someone does something stupid then it's ruined or it takes a lot to repair it, but it's never going to be the same. So there has to be this balance of, well, we're going to let in some people to help bolster what we can do, but we can't let them destroy anything. So I think that we could have a whole conversation, like you said about that. Yeah. Yeah. I I agree. Totally agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, mean, yeah. And the thing is, thing thing is there are a lot, a lot of, different conservation ideas around the world and i did a lot of work in norway and sweden back in the 1990s and there they did they had this thing called a sacrifice where they sacrificed one panel of engraved rock art where they would paint over it so people could actually see where the engraving was without having to walk on it or move light around it it was there painted red and in some mm. cases they've rapidly reburied some of the rock art panels, not just because of vandalism, but also because the environmental conditions are not right. good in certain parts of Norway because of things like, for, for example, acid rain, which has had right. quite a, a quite an amazing effect or had a, a detrimental effect on the on the on the rock surfaces. So yeah, there's a lot to be talked about on that in that particular aspect of of conservation. Yeah, it's there's a lot that could be talked about. Um... Moving to our next story, though, because as we said, that could be a whole episode on its own. Did you hear about the quote megastructure uh, from the Stone Age that was found that was built by Paleolithic hunters ten thousand years ago? Uh, no, but whereabouts is it? <laughs> <laughs> so, archaeologists, I'm reading the article at the moment. I'm quoting. Archaeologists have identified what may be Europe's oldest human-made megastructure, submerged 21 meters below the Baltic Sea in the Bay of... Oh, yes, yes, I have seen, yes, it's a wall, isn't it? Metalberg. Yes, it's a wall, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 
that's 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 very interesting because uh, again, if you look at the shoreline displacement, which is basically the rise and level, the rise right. rising of sea level, uh, as opposed to the rising of land mass, what they call eustatic rise, there's a lot going on underneath the Baltic, um, <laughs> and I. I remember, I remember that one of my big heroes is a guy called Soren Anderson. And Soren Anderson in the 1980s did a big excavation on a site called Tybrin Big. Now, Tybrin Big is a submerged site. It's about two or three metres under the water. But during the uh, uh, late Mesolithic, so we're talking about around about 5,000 BC, 6,000 BC, there was a settlement with canoes and paddles and hearths and all all the all the all the trappings you would want to see on a Mesolithic settlement site was there, uh, and um, that's now about two or three meters below the sea level uh, in eastern in the eastern part of Denmark, um, and that, that was excavated by Soren Anderson's team in the uh, oh actually in the early sorry late nineteen seventies early nineteen eighties so I think he published his paper in nineteen eighty one, uh, but. That is just one of a number of submerged sites you've got around that archipelago of of islands uh, to the east of Jutland and Zealand, which is the, the two main islands that make up Denmark. So yes, I do know about yeah. the wall, uh, and it's uh, they they reckon it was a probably a stocking stocking enclosure. I they know. they think yeah, it had something to do with the way they would hunt reindeer. Uh, they would corral the reindeer somehow, you know, using this wall to get them to go where they wanted, so they could. Can I? Can I whisper you a secret? Can I whisper you sure. a secret? What is it? Seth, Tell me. Seth, I don't. I don't want anybody else to know this, but apart from you and the listeners. But okay. I was in a. I was in a certain cave in southern Spain. I went down to the third level, which is which no one's allowed down there unless you're doing research. I managed to flag my way down there, and guess what? We have got corrals made from timber being painted on several walls. Me and actually Genevieve were down there. Me and Genevieve went down there and saw it, uh, and we were allowed to photograph it, so I photographed it. And again, that's something we can probably talk about in a later podcast because that's a, a story in itself. Um, you yeah. not, just the, um, not just what I saw. But the actual experience of going through a very, very fantastic cave system, going down a flight of of of, of a, a ladder, a uh, flight of steps, and then down another flight of steps to this amazing site, uh, and I, I'm happy to talk about that. I'll, 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 in, the, in the meantime, I'll have a word with the owner of the cave and see if he's <laughs> happy for me to talk about it. But it, I, I think I can talk about it without uh, telling you where it is. But I will. Um, I'll see. I'm sure he'll allow, allow me to talk about it. Uh, so the next podcast, very we, cool. We can talk about that. That'd be excellent. Uh, yes, that sounds very exciting. Um, I just, I, uh, guys, if you haven't been in a cave before, I, you're missing out. I mean, yeah, honestly, I know you are. Yeah, claustrophobia. Uh, danger of falling, sure. slipping over, <laughs> getting wet. I mean, besides <laughs> all head. that, besides all that, I don't know. For me, maybe I'm a dwarf inside. I don't know. But when I'm underground, and I've only been to, you know, like tourist caves, like literal caves, like you pay money and they take you on a like, tour to the cave. Because that's what we have in the States unless you're doing research, which I'm not. There, there's no research I would be doing in the caves in the U.S., you know. Um, yes, I'm not spelunking really. I want to, but um, <laughs> anyway, it's fun. Being, it's fun, honestly. <laughs> it is. But being underground, you just, for me at least, there's this sense of. I. It's strange to say because you know there's how who knows how many tons of rock above you, but there's this feeling of safety almost. And I don't know. I just you're literally going into the womb of the earth, and it just for me at least the few times I've gotten the pleasure of going into the cave, whether it's some um, that's actually um funny story. Charles Manson, 
familiar? Oh, I know Charles Manson. Okay. Not a friend of mine. I'm not a friend not of mine, friend. but I know him. Right. Okay. So if you're familiar with the story at all, one of his, um, I don't remember what they're called, one of his girls or whatever, was supposed to take all of the children from the commune or cult or whatever they had going on, and they were going to hide in these caves in Northridge, California. That's literally where I lived up until a few months ago. And a friend of mine knew where these caves were. And we actually went to these caves. And like literally, this was a cave that Charles Manson had been to and was planning on having his last like fake out in. And it it was kind of it had a very creepy vibe to it. Um <laughs> <laughs> it had a very creepy vibe to it, but it was still a cave and it was still just it was it doesn't even have to be a big extravagant cave. It was a small little I don't know how deep it went because I didn't want to be stupid and just go, but mm. it was it was cool. So anyone guys, don't go, you know, all alone into random caves or anything. <laughs> but if if you're a professional or even if you can't get on a tour somewhere and just be underground and see like why our ancestors went into caves, at least. You know, get that own feeling for yourself of why is it special to be in a cave? Why was someone paying on these walls? And again, as you know, Genevieve and I have discussed, and I'm sure you and I have discussed, rock art has been everywhere. It's just it's preserved in caves because of the environment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's, yeah. It, it's not like they only painted in caves. It's just that's where it's preserved. Yeah. But random tangent over. Um, well, I was, I was going to add to that a random tangent, in fact, because I've talked about this, I think, previously, but there's a, for, for some of the listeners who, who had the pleasure of going to Rufniak, which is in southwestern France, it's a show cave, and today you go down there, you go on a little train journey inside the cave for about two oh, kilometers. Wow. Yeah, so you're chugging along on this on this electric train going into the, um, into, into the, into the, into the depths of the earth for two, for two kilometers. Wow. I now I, I now I want you and the listeners to take away that train mm -hmm. and there not to be a straight uh, 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 track into towards the rock art. You have to climb over jagged rocks in the dark. Uh, you have to orientate yourself in a particular way to get through into a, a multi-faceted cave with lots and lots of side uh, alcoves and whatever. How on earth do you navigate from the entrance to the place where you meant to place your bit of rock art and then come back out again. And that's, again, another interesting point to consider. I, I'm sorry, listeners, we digress. All right. So, you know, we totally went off and talked about caves and going into caves, and while that is awesome, why don't we go back to this 10,000-year-old wall that was constructed and um, I know you wanted to talk more about it, so why don't we just go right back into it? Yeah, I, well, I, well, like I said, that that that's, the Baltic is really interesting because obviously there's been a lot of uh, natural transgression and regression of the sea level or the, the the lake level because it was actually a series of lakes ten thousand, fifteen thousand years ago, uh, uh, and we know this from the you know the very good paleo environmental evidence that's been. Uh, undertaken or paleo environmental research has been undertaken there over the last hundred odd years. But the point I wanted to make, uh, when I was whispering to you about this particular site in south southern Spain, um, was that there was evidence, clear evidence from the rock art that during the Paleolithic, uh, modern humans, I think particularly modern humans, were thinking about hunting, fishing, gathering in a very, very different way. Now, we have this traditional idea that we go out into the forest, we hunt our megafauna, bring them back, skin them, eat them, and then we go out hunting again. And quite clearly, I think that what we're looking at here, we're both looking in the Baltic and on the rock art in southern Spain, is that we're starting to see the idea about the idea of corralling, for example, and, idea, and also maybe the idea of seasonal slaughter. Now, this is very, very important mm -hmm. because the one thing you don't want to be doing is killing off your natural, sorry, your younger juvenile red deer, for example, in the right. latter part of the Paleolithic. Because if you do that, you both get rid of the male and the female, and then they don't reproduce. 
So you are basically hunting or you're corralling the older stock that you've, you've collected it from the wild, corral them into a pen, and you kill to eat, basically. And I think this is what's going on. So at this particular cave site, which we can't mention at the moment, um, <laughs> is that there is a, one corralling scene there. We've got these these lines in a ovate or egg-like shaped uh, 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 painting. And they are as big as, I would say, they're about half a metre in diameter. So it's quite a big painting. Oh, wow. And then, and then at some point, an artist has painted in the middle of that uh, that 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 circle of of stakes or fencing uh, a single uh, red deer painted in yellow, but also that overlies a series of double hoof prints. Now that just tells me that 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 is a, a stock corral for holding in uh, a red deer, and we see that. Quite clearly, in, even in the prehistoric period, if you go to Alta, for example, in northern Norway, you've got the Sami there who are doing exactly the same. They are corralling the reindeer uh, and killing them off seasonally. And they're particularly killing off those animals that are old uh, and have gone past their their use in terms of their as their fertility right. and in terms of their fertility. So, uh, so I think really what we're seeing here is a more organised society in the certainly in the late upper Paleolithic, certainly certainly in the Mesolithic, where people are very, very carefully thinking about a month by month way, almost like a calendar of where you when you can uh, you can collect your wild animals, corral them, and then start to control them as if they were stock. So very much like very much like what we're doing in the in the Neolithic, for example, this idea of of fencing in bits of landscape. Uh, called fields, and then uh, holding within those fields the stock, such as cattle, uh, pig, sheep, goat. But in this case, in the Paleolithic, we're looking at red deer. And again, we see a really good example of that, both in the ethnographic record, the historical record, and also in the prehistoric record in northern Norway on the rock art of Alta, where we've got that clear, um, sort of Sami-like uh, 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 way of, of, of economy, where you, buy your, you are corralling reindeer in this particular case reindeer up in northern norway but in southern spain and probably in the baltic it's probably red deer very interesting and you know there's a lot more to say about that i know we could do a whole episode on that as well um, yeah. and learning about when we can that cave you keep mentioning it sounds quite exciting um uh, the cave, i the cave working on the moment yeah yes <laughs> Um, I, I I can't name the cave, but I'm going to name it now. I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it Seth Cave. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Sounds good to me. Sounds good <laughs> to me. So we'll refer to it as that. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, yeah. <laughs> so moving right along, did you? There was this other interesting story that came up this month on uh, the 14th, which. That's Valentine's Day, isn't it? I don't know. It's don't Valentine's know Day, yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, about these, quote, mysterious comb drawings may be the oldest paintings in South America. I don't know if you saw this one. It is about the soaring stone walls of Argentina's Juanel, or Juan, yeah, Juanel Cave, a 630 meter square rock shelter in northern Patagonia. And it has 900, yeah, it has 900 distinct paintings of geometric shapes, people, and animals. Now, it is now being dated to about around 8,200 years ago, which is far older than they had originally uh, predicted. And again, when we're thinking about these dates and these localities, it's important to remember people thought humans arrived in the Americas, what, 10,000 years ago? The Clovis people, 10,000 years ago, something? Allegedly. 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 Right, right. So if we already have in Patagonia cave art that's 8,200 years old, Clearly, we were in North America much earlier than that. 
So this, again, just goes along with bolstering the idea that humans arrived in the Americas much earlier than thought. And um, so these images, they look like a standard, you know, a tooth comb. Um, and they, they're all over the place in this cave. And we're not exactly sure what it means. Of course, because we don't really know what cave art means in general. And you say, it says here that, of course, there's no way of knowing the meaning behind the motif, the comb shaped paintings were apparently part of the process. You have very small human groups in a large homogeneous landscape, says co author Ramiro Barbanera, an archaeologist at Concept. Communicating where to meet to exchange information and partners is fundamental for the viability of these groups. So they're thinking that it was some sort of, you know, group symbol. Like, this is our representation of our group. We're the, we're the cone people. Um, and that's kind of what they're thinking at the moment. And these images have appeared over a long span of time. It wasn't just they were made 80, 200 years ago. It was continuously made until these, uh, until this locality seemed to have been abandoned. Um, now, you, of course, know much more than I do about rock art in South Africa. I mean, South America. Frankly, rock art yeah. everywhere. But um, what can you tell us about? Do you know of this locality, the um, okay. Juan, El, Juan El Cave? Yeah. What can you I, tell I, us I about the site? It's, it's part of a quite a large cave system, a series of caves within that area. And remember, in the same area, you've got the famous Cave of Pants. Uh, okay, you, I was wondering. Nobody knows about that. So it, it's it's there's there's some really interesting stuff going on there at the moment. Uh, some very good, very good research as well, uh, using a lot of really good up-to-date technology. Um, the, I suppose that one thing I'd be thinking about, again, this way we need probably Genevieve to chip in because she obviously does these things on science, geometric science. Yeah. And I dare say they would have a, a, a lot more, she'd have a lot more of, a, of, a, of an understanding about what they represent than probably you or I. However, I will say that the, the comb uh, images that I've seen uh, it's the same images I've seen that you're you're looking at now. Um, they do have a resemblance with uh, what we see in sometimes in the. the I suppose, I can't put it. You know when you go through different phases, different uh, periods. Or if you're a painter, you go for a red period or a blue right, period, right? Right. Yeah. And I, 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 in the Mesolithic, you've got this idea. You go from a transition from the Paleolithic to the Mesolithic. So in the in Europe it's around about ten thousand BC to eight thousand BC, and you go from representative animals such as the Magdalenian animals right through to simplified animals and then to geometric signs, and then you go into something else and then something else and then something else. So there's a pattern emerging, and I think that's a synchronous uh, throughout the world. There's no idea of any uh, suggestion of contact or exchange. Forget that. I believe it's within the human psyche that we are, we are evolving as modern humans into various different types of, of uh, hunter-gatherer. However, the one thing that binds us together is the idea of communication, for example, and, the, and also the way we express ourselves in an, an artistic form, artistic or a communicative form. And I think that what's going on in the, US, in the United States, North, North, North America, in South America and Europe and elsewhere around the world is, 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 is synchronous. It's happening roughly at the same time. And I think it's because of the, of the major developments that are occurring in terms of our technology and our understanding of technology, which, again, you can't really say that, you know, um, that what's going on in South America uh, and what's happening in Europe at a particular point in time is happening because they're in, they're in contact with each other. We know that's ridiculous. However, it's happening nonetheless. And so I think it's an interesting point to consider. Um, so the idea of those comb drawings, I've seen them, ex I've seen similar ones to that, both in uh, in the Iberian Peninsula and also within uh, a couple of islands uh, where we've got very rare uh, um, engravings occurring on stone, uh, which have become uh, fossilised. I can't, 
a petrified is a better word. They become petrified, right, right. and and these comb uh, in, uh, in engravings in the ones I'm talking about in uh, on these islands around the British Isles, they're engraved, uh, but they are associated with a very very stylized stylistic red deer. So all you need to pro to produce a red deer, if you're an artist in a hurry, are two lines for legs, two vertical lines for legs, then a line going from one leg to the other. So that's three lines. And if you want to be really artistic, you then draw a line either left or right to symbolize a head, one line, that's all you need. So that's four lines so far. If you're determining whether it's male or female, you draw a phallus on the male. So that's five lines. And if you be if you're feeling really artistic, then you will try and draw the antlers of the red deer on that line, and that could be a series of scratches. And this is right. what I'm seeing on maybe three or four different engraving panels in various parts of the British Isles, which are roughly dated to the Mesolithic. Um, so you would, if you were elsewhere, you'd say, "Oh, these are comb drawings," but I think if you look carefully. Uh, through if they're painted then you use d stretch um you might you may be in for a bit of surprise i think they may be actually style a stylistic type uh, a stylistic way of 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 reproducing an, an animal but right. I, i've seen them i've seen the report but i haven't looked at the the art in any great detail however i would probably suggest that there is something i i, I think last time we spoke in fact this is important this is that the more simpler the design that you right. see on wall the more complex the narrative the story behind it and i still i still hold that idea from our last podcast absolutely and that you know that was something i think you called it your um your something for the week it was like your your comment for the week was oh my one one my one line of the week yeah the more simple yes, the yes. Line, yeah the more simple the, line, the more complex the narrative is and i bet you any money that when you start to look at the archaeology below that panel in the in the rock shelter uh, cave or rock shelter earths or the cave earths, you start to see a complex uh, archaeology you know, unveil around you. And that will then determine whether or not you're dealing with a simple series of, 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 of paintings or something which is completely different, which is something far more complex than, you, than, you, than you're looking at. Right. Um, so, you know, there is something that we, sh it's going to take a whole episode to talk about, and, and we keep saying this, but there really are just so many topics out there that <laughs> I there is so much information out there that it takes so long to really truly cover it. And we want to make this podcast about multiple things. We don't want to just focus on one thing so it's kind of hard but um if we do get jean claude on i think it would be a perfect time to discuss what happened thirty-seven thousand years ago where all of a sudden we have geometric signs like genevieve has been talking about and then we get chauvet something yeah. like something happened <laughs> where yeah. all of a sudden we go from markings just Chauvet, who, if people are unfamiliar again, Cave of Forgotten Dreams, Chauvet, it's miraculous. It's miraculous. Um, so, what happened? Something happened. And, you know, I think if we get him on discussing maybe what that was, could be quite an interesting, quite an interesting episode. I know I would be, I don't even know what I would say at the time, but. <laughs> well, um, well, John, John. Johnny, what he was the actual scientific advisor. Uh, I think he was head of the scientific, I know. scientific, yeah. scientific committee at Borchove, and he did a lot. I mean, he's done 120 radiocarbon dates on that case. Wow! Still gets a lot. Of, he still gets a lot of criticism from um, from the sort of more bizarre end of of the researchers in the Paleolithic. But I think he did a, a bloody good job on that particular right. uh, that particular case. It was just redated, wasn't it? To now being thirty-seven thousand, or yeah, yeah exactly. It was yeah, yeah. Redated. yeah, yeah, yeah. They they suggested originally. I think the first grade complex were thirty-two, thirty-three thousand, 
Uh, and what's really interesting about that is Seth, that if we were if, if we were going there 20 years ago or 25 years ago into that cave into Chauvet in 1994, and we weren't Jean Clot, we didn't have the the luxury of radiocarbon dating, we would have said, oh, it's Magdalene. Yeah. Yeah. Well, most certainly we've said it's Magdalene, and clearly it's not. It's something like, which is far much, far more earlier than that. So again, it just turns the these little things, these little sites, these little discoveries, which is a big discovery. It, surprisingly, how much it can turn the whole of the traditional field upside down. And again, it's a bit like uh, when uh, when uh, uh, Nia de Guidon was working in uh, in in, in Piwi in, in Brazil, when she said she had the audacity to say that we have rock art here, which is 27, 28, 29,000 BC, when right. you guys in North America were saying there's no such thing as pre clovis There was nothing before 10,000 BC. Well, quite clearly there was. As we are finding out, as we find out, because the science gets better and better and better, we're finding out more things. You know, Paisley Caves in Oregon was once right. you know, 10,000. It's now 18,000 BC. So we you know the people living there 18,000 or well, twenty thousand years ago, so yeah, so we, we've we we've, we we've, we've crossed over the pre clovis by ten thousand years. Yeah, the I know Genevieve and I have said it. I know you and I have said it. I'm sure I've said it on my other show, the story of us on YouTube, probably with many guests. Clovis is dead. The Clovis yeah. first idea is dead, buried six I'm feet sorry. under the ground. It is. It's yeah. done. Um, yeah. Clovis points are beautiful. They're cool. We can learn a lot from them, but they are not the original tools of the Americas. And we need to. There are a lot of books out right now, like Origins by Jennifer Raff, and definitely a lot of others who are fighting this idea. But it's really high time that we really put that out in the public. Because I think, I mean, when I was in elementary school, that's already. 20 years ago um clovis first was was still the um the chosen the main idea so that's what i learned uh in elementary school but i don't know what they're teaching now and obviously in the u.s it depends on what state you're in um in some states (laughs) in some states you know adam and eve just appeared out of nowhere but um (laughs) It's, it's, it's all the same state. It's all the same. It's all the same states that vote for Trump. I'm allowed to say that. Oh, of course. Uh, well, <laughs> I can because I'm English. I, <laughs> let's put it this way. I think um, my listeners are probably of a certain intelligence leaning. Yes, intelligence and leaning. Um, so I, I, I know I have made comments before, not blatantly because i don't want to start anything with people but um let's just put it this way the trump uh group probably would not be a fan of what we discuss on these <laughs> podcasts um no, no, no. yeah so i mean completely i no no i'm not gonna go there it's too too much anyway <laughs> the, the next story that we have on the paper. Did you have one that you wanted to talk about? I, I just I just have an update really in many respects. Okay. I've mentioned I've mentioned to um listeners before about a, a cave site that I'm involved in in South Wales. And again just to put the people in the picture. Um up, up, up to about 12 13,000 years ago the majority of the British Isles was covered in uh, over a kilometer of ice. And there was just one sort of area in South Wales called the Gower Coast. Uh, if you look on a map, just type in Gower, G-O-W-E-R, Gower Coast. And along that southern line of the Gower Coast are 95 caves, and nearly all of them have yielded some form of archaeology, mainly Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic archaeology. So they're very rich in terms of their archaeology. And I've been doing, I did a big cave project there in, uh, in one cave, Catole, about uh, in 2010 to 2012, 13, and we dated the got the first rock art in Wales. There, we actually got the oldest rock art in the British Isles, going back to about 13, 14,000. So it was nice. So we were very lucky. We had a um, a uh, a flowstone over the engraving, and because we could date, we got a minimum date 
of I think around about 15,504 years, plus or minus a couple hundred years either side. So, uh, so it's so we we got cat hole, and then uh, we've been looking at another cave, uh, which is not too far from there, in fact, but it's a massive sea cave, a remarkable site. And what's really interesting about the cave site is that every cave that I've been involved in, or anybody else has been involved in, there's always been a degree of lithics that's come up. So you can then save Seth, say, "Well, look, I've got a an uh, old nation uh, point here, so therefore we're looking around about 30,000 BC, or we've got a a late upper Paleolithic series of, of points here, Cheddararian, or um, so the thing of these and Cheddararians, and the one that I've turned these from, yeah, Creswellian crack points. So we can say that they're about 14,000, and they tie in with other bits of archaeology in there. Now, in this other particular cave, I can't mention its name just yet, but I'm about to get a uh, about to get back to secure it with a, a steel grill across the oh, wow. more, the more sensitive part of the cave. Um, actually, on Friday, this Friday coming up, and um, uh, we've got no lithics there whatsoever. So, so all we've got is some faunal evidence of co- that, does, that has come up. Some batches of very, very nice large megafauna, uh, including mammoth. And we've also got a bit of rock art, actually, very, very nice rock art, which we've now dated. We've now got a date of 15,700. So it's wow. now the earliest rock art we have in Northwestern Europe. And um, again, when we've got time, um, I'll tell the whole story because there's a really interesting story. And I, I think I've said to you before. Sometimes the archaeological story or the history yes. of the archaeology is as important as the archaeology itself. So I'm, I'm happy to do a half an hour or more of talking about this particular cave site. Uh, but it's very interesting because what's happening now, we're in that sort of um, that sort of uh, sort of transitional phase of we've made the discovery. And then what we have to do is what do we do next? And what we want to do next is secure the cave area where the rock art is. And because there are bats there, so it's a protected site. It's what they call right. a triple SR. And that means a, a site of special scientific interest. So it means if there's bats there or a particular moth there or a particular spider there, then the cave gets protected because of its ecology. So we've got the right. bats there. Right. We've got we've got the rock art there. And it's convenient that they all roost in this one part where the rock art is. <laughs> so, we've now got a, so, so on, on Friday, next Friday coming up, I'm going to be going down there with uh, the authorities, so that's CADU, which is the equivalent of English Heritage, and the National Trust, who are the, who are the, who are the landowners. And uh, we will then dis- determine where the, where the gate, or the, where the, the grill, the gated mm. uh, uh, steel grill is going to go. And, and then we can start to work out the conservation issues of, of that particular part of the cave and see if there's any more archaeology required. Now, but luckily for me, being an archaeologist with my archaeology hat on, rather than my paleoanthropological hat on, is that I've got the hopefully got the contract to dig a slot, uh, uh, maybe half a meter wide by half a meter, maybe more deep, uh, so the grill goes under the soil, so nobody can sort of tunnel under it, under it to get into the sensitive right, part of right. the so all these mitigation issues are going to be very, very important to work out how we do the conservation. And w- I was involved in that with cattle because when cattle started to be vandalised, it was dis- made. It was a decision was made by CADU, the National Authorities for Heritage in Wales. They decided to put a grill right across half the cave. And so far, I'm just touching wood now. It's never been penetrated by any stupid people. So that's so it's yeah. doing its job. So this is what we're going to be doing with with uh, with with this particular site that I've been been working on. Almost gave the name away then. Um, so, <laughs> so so that's the next stage. So the next stage is to determine where the, the grill is going to go. How deep is the slot going to be? So that's going to be done archaeologically. You can't just dig a hole. So we're going to dig it archaeologically. We're then going to schedule the site. The site at the moment isn't scheduled, so it isn't protected archaeologically. It's protected eco- ecologically, but not archaeologically. And then we can then think about further research. Now, the good news is that um, the Bradshaw Foundation, who some of your listeners may or may not know, a very, very good website for looking at rock art anywhere around the world. Um, they very, very kindly given us quite a big grant. 
uh, along with the National Trust, to do the archaeology and to do the sampling. So we're going to do some more sampling there because when we did the sampling there on April the 2nd last year, we only managed to get one sample for one part of the rock art. And, 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 and in order to make sense of it, what we need to do is get a couple more samples, split the samples, because we're talking about sub-milligram uh, 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 pieces of pigment, and send them off to different labs to date. And then we get right. then a general consensus, almost like a Bayesian uh, dating for, the, for that particular panel. And I would put my mortgage on it that the dating we're looking at is around 15,500, 15,700 uh, before, before present, which is a very, very exciting, very exciting. But for, for, yes. for, a frontier, for a frontier landscape that was, you know, cold most of the year round, uh, and it, yes, it did encourage megafauna to come up and, and take advantage of the luscious landscape of sedges, grasses, mosses, lichen. Um, but it was still damn cold. It was minus 10 in the summer. So it was, you know, very much, you know, a land where very little human activity was, was present. However, in the summer months, they were probably occupying the caves, as proven in Catalog Cave, Haviland Cave, Minchin Hole, Deborah's Hole, uh, and this cave that I'm looking at at the moment, where we haven't found any lithics, but there was someone going in there painting it. So, yeah, very exciting. About that. So that's what I'm going to be doing next week. So the book is, the book is out now from last week, and now I turn my attention now to this particular cave site in South Wales, where I'll be doing the um, hopefully sort of doing some more archaeology there and some more sampling. That's so much fun. That just sounds like so much fun. You're um, living in the wrong place, Seth. You're living in the wrong place. Oh, trust me, I'm well aware. I am <laughs> well aware. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I'm too. Unfortunately, I'm too well aware of that. Um, so let's see here. I think that might be a good place to wrap up for this episode. I can't think of any further, I, I can think of plenty of further stories, but how they relate really to this episode or where we're going, maybe we'll save them for further times. Is there anything you would like to talk about before we conclude? Any books know, to review? I, no, there's no books to review this week. It's actually it's been a very quiet front on the book front. Um, I mean, there's been plenty of stuff being published, but not uh, that falls with that with that with our, our sphere of interest. So I, I'm right, I'm, right. Waiting, I'm waiting for the the knock at the door from the postman who will deliver me a big <laughs> book. Um, I mean, I have got. Um, I mean, I did talk about the review a few weeks ago about someone who's been doing a massive study on the rock art of Tibet. And I never right. knew there was rock art there at all until I, until through my letterbox came this massive big volume. I think about 400, 500 pages it was. Oh, wow. That and that's just volume one of five. Oh. So this, oh. So this guy so this guy has spent a long time walking around Tibet, you know, gathering data on rock art. And he's done yeah. it. Really Amazing job. Um, but I, I'm, I'm more than happy next time to talk about that particular book in detail because I've just reviewed it. Yeah, um, it's because that's um like you even just said you didn't know there was rock art there, so I'm sure my know, listeners. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but then, but then when you look at about the rock art areas around Tibet, southern China, uh, Malaysia, the Malaysian Peninsula, Cambodia, Laos, uh, northern India, it's stuff full of rock art. So why not Tibet? So right. it's there, right. man, and it, and I will say some of the stuff there is absolutely exquisite. I mean, beautifully carved. Again, it's a little bit outside our sphere. It's Bronze Age uh, at a push. Uh, but it really does give you an idea about the beauty, the exquisiteness of the of the, some of the, the animals that have been uh, painted and engraved on the rocks in Tibet, which I'll, I'll happily talk about next time. But before, yes. before, we, before we go, I just want to say to our listeners, because I know you'll forget, is please, <laughs> uh, please, if, if there's anything negative or positive about our conversations, please, you know, bring it up, bring it, bring it to the fore and tell us about it, because we would love to get in dis into discussion or debate with you at any time. Absolutely. 100%. Because we love you. We love you. We love you. Yes, we would not be here without you guys. And 
your support in any which way, whether you just like the video, share the video, anything you guys do, it really supports us and it's amazing. So please like, share, and subscribe for more because that's what keeps us going. And, you know, if you do, like, we, if you have something you want us to talk about, We've got George here. He is literally a rock art expert. If you have rock art questions, let us know. I get emails sometimes um, asking questions about more general things. I'm like, why not pose it for the podcast? We could talk about it there. But, you know, guys, let us know. Um, like, uh, while we're talking about this, I actually got an email that I'm going to forward to you, George. Um, it was sent to Genevieve as well. This individual, once I can find the email, here it is. She is a elderly amateur anthropologist, and she has um, the dip, Dipurian contracture. I can't say it, but it's where, and I know this is a podcast that you guys aren't um, looking. I think Genevieve and I actually talked about this, and it was the Viking hand disease where your finger curls and you can't um, you can't lay it flat. Your tendons don't work the way that they're uh, supposed to. Right, they right, kind of lock. Reynolds disease. Possibly, I, I, yeah, that might be what it is. Um, a hereditary condition that would affect the whole. Yeah, so she has this idea that the quote unquote mutilated hands that we sometimes see in caves where you're missing a finger or something is actually possibly people with this disease where their fingers literally won't lay flat. Now, I see some issues with this because wouldn't you still see the finger that's bent in the handprint when you're putting it down? But it's a cool idea, and it's something that next episode we could definitely talk about because it's something a guest or a listener brought to us, and uh, I definitely want to shout out to her. Um, she, Like I said, she sent this email to a few people, some people I don't recognize, but she did send it to Genevieve. Um, but I know you and I can talk about it and hopefully she can get her questions answered uh, on our next episode. Um, so yeah, guys, let us know because we are here to help you. We are here to teach. We're here to educate. We're here to share what we love and our passions and talking to the public is sometimes the best way to do that. I don't know if George is up for it, but maybe one of these days we do a live episode where people can comment yeah. in, the, in the comment section and you can ask questions live. George and I can be chatting. We'll answer your questions as we go. I think that'd be a great idea. It would probably be around um, 10 a.m. Pacific, which is when we, George and I usually um, record these podcasts because he lives in the UK and I live in California. So finding a time that works isn't the easiest but i think we could do a live one and that would definitely be pretty fun uh maybe we could bring a guest on for that too as well we'll see yeah but you know there's a lot we can do with this podcast guys i'm very proud and excited to say that i'm going to be sharing it all over the place at the aaba's in march in los angeles so if you are going to that look forward to seeing me i'll be talking about it we can talk about it and everything else related to the world of paleoanthropology. And with that, everyone, I wish you the best of luck and fortune, and I am signing off. And that is the end of the show. All right.